All right, well, we're going to get started here. It's good to see you this morning. Getting, trying to get started on time is a good thing. Helps to get finished on time. We're going to be uh, in this last section of our study in the doctrine of the imputations, the things that God imputes to us, or uh, one that is things that were imputed to uh, the human nature when Adam and Eve sinned, which was the imputation of the old sin nature. And then, of course, when Christ came and he went to the cross of Calvary, all of our sins, and the Bible says the sins of the whole world, were imputed on him. Unfairly, but the only way that God could reconcile mankind back to himself, that there had to be an innocent that would stand in place of the guilty. And all before God, all of mankind before God is guilty, whether we're the gutter sing, uh, sinners or we're the high and mighty self-righteous sinners, whether we're the immoral or the moral, it makes no difference. Black, white, man or woman, red, yellow, it makes no difference. Boy or girl, it makes no difference. Age of time in which we were born makes no difference. We're all born as sinners because of the sin of Adam, of disobedience. The only way God can reconcile us is through a perfect sacrifice, and that happens to be Jesus Christ. Why does it have to be that? Because God makes people, God makes the rules. There are theologians that have argued that sacrificial system, whether it was the Old Testament or the life of Christ himself, has been irrelevant to the salvation of a soul. But God makes the rules. And that's the first thing that people have to start with when it comes to imputations. God made the rules. Mankind broke them. God didn't have to offer us a plan of redemption, but we're so thankful that he did. He included us individually, and uh, that is a wonderful thing about salvation. It is a personal uh, decision that people have to make. God doesn't make it for us. And once we make that decision, it's... It's forever encapsulated in time and eternity. And nothing can steal it away from us. And for the life of me, I can't understand why people will reject the gospel and eternity and salvation, forgiveness of sins, the comfort of the Spirit of God working with you every day of your life through your various and sundry circumstances. And to turn that down to try to fight and figure it out for yourself in this life, of which if you would be objective and look around the world, it has never worked. People figuring out their own problems and solving them when it comes to the things of the heart and the soul and of the peace and, and, and the confirmation of the afterlife. It only comes through Christ. And we'll talk about that this morning. Don't have too many questions in the bulletin this morning. Just got a few. Our subject this morning is going to be on the crown of life, and uh, this is basics number 539, and uh, eternal rewards, this is our, actually our ninth lesson on the study on eternal rewards as a part of the doctrine of the imputations, blessings in eternity. So, uh, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll look at four distinct Wreaths or crowns as the Bible calls them and uh, we're going to look at those four different ones uh, there's the wreath of righteousness we'll look at that one this morning in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 the wreath of righteousness and then in James 1 12 we'll next time we'll look at the wreath of life the wreath of life or the crown of life these can be ours now, the Bible does not notate this as a part of the uh, blessing plan for Old Testament or millennial believers. Now, what that plan involves, I do not know, but there is no mention of crowns for rewards for Old Testament saints or millennial saints. So I'm not sure how that flushes out at their judgment seat. Jesus will still be their judge. I'm not exactly sure how that it will come out, but I'm sure that in all fairness, uh, the rewards will be fitting, uh, and I'm sure because they're coming from the Lord God himself, they will be magnificent. We can be assured of that. 
But these are in particular addressed to the church, never addressed to Israel. Uh, Old Testament saints prior to Israel or the millennial saints. So we will see uh, when that time comes. But this is our business. So there's the wreath of righteousness, the wreath of life. Then there's the wreath of glory. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, the wreath of glory. And then there's the watchman's crown or the watchman's wreath, Hebrews 13, 17. And so uh, that is the one of the four wreaths. The fourth one is the one that has, I guess, the more, specu uh, more speculations rather than doctrinal input regarding that particular wreath. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, then we'll, we'll get started here in just a moment. Father, we thank you for the privilege of learning your word, of coming together in a free nation, studying the scriptures, sharing in one another's life experience, and lifting each other up in a time of prayer, not just here, but when we go home, when we're sitting on our couch or our chair in the middle of the afternoon, and so-and-so's so concerns comes to mind that we shared in fellowship we lift them up at that time to the throne of God in prayer. And we put a supp supplication prayer up in and, and that person's name and that particular need. You see our heart. You sense what we want. And though you know the answer and the need of that person, you sense the community that you appreciate seeing among your children when we pray for one another we know one another we see one another we hear one another and we sense their joy and their pain father we thank you that this community of believers is uh, living and doing as you'd have us to live and do according to the word we have that opportunity we pray father that we're taking advantage of it thank you now for this time of study today we ask you to bless this study to our edification and to our sanctification for your glory and for our good. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And when I say sanctification, I'm not talking about positional sanctification. I'm talking about practicing sanctification. Not progressive justification. Justification is, is instantaneous the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and verse 1 sanctification of our practice in life. We're completely set apart unto God, but our practice in life, uh, we uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, the classified documents in Biden's house. They just come out and they just drip here, one there, and drips here, and drips here. You know, there's probably a couple under the cat bowl. I don't know. It's just like they're using for placemats or something. But anyway, in 2 Timothy, we're going to look at that one in a moment, but I wanted to note what we noted last time is that the wreaths represent those who triumphed in the struggles of the faith. They triumphed in the struggles of the faith. Paul said, as he said in 2 Timothy 4, I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. That's what he said. He had said prior to that in verse 3 of 2 Timothy 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or sound healthy teaching, but after their own desires, they will heat to themselves. They will hire, they will listen to teachers who will scratch their ears, who will give them what they want to hear. They shall turn away their ears. These false teachers will turn away these, these believers who are dissatisfied with truth those false teachers will turn away those believers' ears from the truth. They're talking about believers, not unbelievers in this passage. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, not the evangelist, but share the gospel in other words, and make full proof of thy, of thy ministry. In other words, demonstrate the profit of what you preach that the Word of God does work. That's how you make full proof of the ministry. You demonstrate the profit of the Word of God in your life. Then Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, or the good fight. I have finished the course, my course. 
and I have kept the faith. So the wreaths are presented to those who keep the faith. And as we'll see in verse 8, there's laid up for me, Paul said, a crown of righteousness. Not for me only, but for all those. And I will emphasize the word henceforth when we get to that exposition in a moment. But the wreaths represent those who triumphed in the struggles of the faith. They represent those deserving of public honor for distinguished service, following the faith. They represent those whose honor will be undiminished for all eternity because of their faith while they were here, like you and I are presently alive. And so it does matter what we do now. It does matter what we are now. No one in the body of Christ is insignificant. By the grace of God, we keep persevering in the faith. In the midst of our trials and setbacks, in the midst of our, many of us, advancing years and the trying of our faith yet to come, we keep on confidently trusting in the promise of the Lord and the Lord's word. We keep on trusting confidently in the promises of the Lord's word. Let's not lose sight of the finish line as we're in the last laps of our life. As it is said in Hebrews 11 and verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The word faith is not the word of God. There's no definite article here. The word the is a definite article which identifies specificity to that particular noun. Here we have the indefinite article, if you want to call it, instead of being articular, it's anarthrous. And what it does, it refers to your personal faith. Your personal faith, as you exercise your personal faith, whether you know little about the Bible or you know a lot about the Bible, whether you've been saved a long time or a little time, the exercising of your personal faith and things that God has promised or things that you hope for, well, that evidence of your faith is the evidence of things, of the things that have not yet been seen. Why do you keep going to church if all you do is go to the cemetery and you cease to your, you forever cease to exist? Why do you watch your behavior if you think that you're not going to have to give account for it? Why do you do good works if you think that there's no difference between those who do good works and those who just slough out the Christian life? Because the evidence of why you do the right thing is proof of the veracity or the truthfulness of your faith. This is the spiritual realm that we're talking about. This is the spiritual realm. You can't quantify it the way you do in the human realm. Your personal faith in the exercise of that is the evidence of things not seen. Your personal faith as it's demonstrated in the faithfulness and your faithfulness to God is the evidence that you believe in God and that your faith is attached to the, an object that is so real to you that it even drives people to their martyrdom. It drives people to give up uh, finances. It drives people to give up their time so that they can spend it around God and God's word and God's people. The object of our faith as Christians is Jesus Christ. It's not some mantra. It's not some marketing ploy. It's not some fantastic emotional experience. It is a person. My faith is in a person. Your faith is in a person. It's Jesus Christ. But personal faith is the substance. I want us to note that the word substance is translated assurance. Personal faith is that you have an assurance. That's an assurance that God gives you. You have an assurance of the things that you hope for, not wish. Hope, alpida, means confidently expect. Your personal faith or is the assurance of the things that you hope for. Apparently, there are a lot of Christians. I'm not speaking to the unsaved right now. I'm speaking to Christians overall. Apparently, a lot of Christians do not have assurance of salvation. And they do not have confidence in what is to be expected. So they don't mind not worshiping. They don't mind not praying. They don't mind not being faithful as the Bible calls them also to be faithful. But your personal faith, when you exercise it, it helps even to grow your assurance in the things hoped for. Because we trust 
the promises of God. And the more you and I trust the promises of God, the stronger that assurance grows, the stronger our personal faith grows. You see, it makes no difference how much doctrine or truth you may have in your heart. It doesn't move your personal faith forward one step. There are people who have very little understanding of the Bible who will take a thousand steps to learn the Word of God, to do the things of God. And there are people who know the Bible frontwards and backwards that just seem like it's all academic. They may be saved, but it's just academic. That's personal faith. Trusting the promises of God. There are people who know the Bible, but they don't trust God. They don't trust God. They don't have a right understanding of God. God is to be trusted. The children of Israel, when they crossed over the Red Sea, they didn't trust God, so they built a golden calf terrible thing to do but when we put personal faith in the word of God the Bible well that then is shown through our personal convictions that we trust in the things not seen as it reads in the scripture you see we trust God's person we trust God's promises that we believe he is and he's a reward of those who diligently seek him that's Hebrews 11 and verse 6 and because we do trust God and what he says and what he promises, we give evidence to that trust by living out a holy life, by cooperating with fellow believers, by witnessing in Christ's name. We trust his righteousness to be the only standard by which our lives are saved. I don't trust in John. I trust in Christ and the word of God. I don't trust that I can save myself. I have no trust in that at all. And I have proven by being a sinner that I don't have any reason to trust myself. I am damaged goods. But when I receive Christ as Savior, I trust in Him. You trust in Him when you receive Him. So we trust His righteousness to be the only standard by which our lives are not only saved, And lives that are not only transformed into Christ's image. Because only by his righteousness are we transformed into the image of Christ. The character of Christ. Not by works or having gifts or talents. But only by the word and the righteousness that we understand from the word of God. Do we then have the, the knowledge for which the Holy Spirit and then can help us to understand where we need to change. You see, sometimes we don't know where we need to change. The Bible teaches us where we need to change, and it gives us the step for making that change. It's a process. But we trust his righteousness to do that. And we also trust that it is his righteousness that will be the standard at the being the seat of Christ. We're not going to pull the wool over his eyes, as we said Wednesday night. We're not going to get all emotional for him and, and then start doing all that. The sin nature won't be in us, so we won't, have a, we won't have a predisposition to contend with our Savior, like we do now, apparently. We won't have a predisposition to contend with the Savior, because that comes from the old sin nature. We'll just be just as calm as a little lamb, as quiet as a little lamb, as mousy as a little mouse. We won't even squeak. He won't have to lock our heels, as I've said and others have said before. He won't have to do that because there won't be a sin nature in us. We will just, just take our medicine and give the answer as honestly as we know to give it at that time. We won't try to pull the wool over his eyes. We won't try to contend with him. None of that will happen. We will be completely compliant. Even those who go to hell will be completely compliant. They won't have a sin nature either. That goes away when you die. The result of how you're going to spend eternity is on how you received or didn't receive Christ in this life. There's not just fighting and fussing and feuding in hell. Everybody's going to be completely compliant in their own little secret isolated compartment. Some suffer more than others, I imagine. 
just like there'll be some blessed more and more joyous in heaven because we will be with the light of the world, the Lord Jesus. It'd be much different for us, of course. People need a reality check on what's going to happen when they die because I think it would change a lot of behavior now. I think it would change a lot of apathy that is in Christianity now. But, or should I say, has the callous become so hardened in the hearts of God's people, saved people, that even with the teaching that I or others may give that is so to the point about their personal life and what to expect, that it does not register with them? That's the problem. I have taught the Bible, and it just irks me to no end that sometimes the things that I, I'm not saying you, you're here. But people that I've taught the Bible to, it does not even register that that is their future. It's just the dumb heads. They're just dull of hearing, as it says in Hebrews chapter 5. Completely so callous with their own personal pursuits that the Word of God does not even pinch their nerves in their spirit world, in their spiritual realm. And that is a sad thing. That's what I call dead man walking, dead woman walking. Callous, callous, callous. Wouldn't know the Spirit of God if it bit them in the backside. Wouldn't understand it. But we're not that way. Thank God that we're not, but we could be that way. Or maybe we have been that way and we've come out of it. Or we're, we're struggling because it will, the, Satan will work to get us as callous as we can become. But at the judgment seat of Christ, it will be the righteousness of God that is our judge. That is his standard. It's the Word of God. So it's all about who you put your trust in. And I say that to people in particular who may be listening in. Can you prom can you trust on the one that you put your trust in to deliver the goods? That is to get you into paradise, to get you into the promised land, to get you to heaven after death to take your sins away which are an offense to God can that person or that method deliver on its promise to get you to heaven at death and give your soul in the meantime the assurance that you are going to heaven when you die I've heard of people who are in the Protestant faith denomination who most believe in the basic principles of who Christ is and what he has provided in salvation. That do not trust that they will go to heaven when they die, that they cannot, cannot know. Well, I'm going to tell you the Bible says that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God gives you the assurance of your salvation. And if you say, well, if I believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior and I don't have the assurance of salvation, and God gives the assurance of salvation, which means I still don't trust him. I'm religious as all get out. I know the creeds. I know the hymns. I just don't trust him. Because it's not just knowing tons of Bible knowledge that gives you assurance of salvation. It's trusting what you do know. And the Spirit gives the trust. God doesn't have us walking around as if there's a question mark over our heads as whether or not we're his or not. He makes it well known to us in our spirit spirit that we are his and if you might be intellectually attracted to Christ but you are not pinging with the spirit of God that's the first doctrine that the spirit of God teaches a new Christian that they're saved how can I have a testimony and a witness for Christ and I don't even trust him to save me saving is not just forgiving you of your sins saving is also delivering you into eternity Gives you eternal life. Part of the gift of eternal life is the assurance of salvation. That comes with eternal life. And if you don't have the assurance of salvation, most likely you don't have eternal life. Because part of the gift that comes with eternal life is the assurance that you're saved. You see, I don't care how I live if I'm not sure if I'm going to make it or not. But once you know you're going to make it, it should have all of the motivation that's necessary to keep learning about what it's like to be a Christian. 
So I'll say for you who have friends who don't know, they say, well, I don't know if, I, if you can know. I would say, I would confront them on that issue. I would say, do you really trust God? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Told him, I'm putting all my eggs in your basket. Because those are the folks who keep a few eggs out for themselves. Kind of like the Judaizers who say, when they got, supposedly, when they got saved, they say, yeah, we, James even said it, we can get saved, but we still got to get circumcised. We're, we're still not going to be in God's favor. We're not. They didn't understand it. But the trust question is, who do you trust? Do you trust yourself or your efforts? Do you trust Muhammad, some folks out there, and his teachings? Do you trust Joseph Smith and his teachings over the Bible? Over God's teaching in the Word? Do you trust Charles Taze Russell and his teachings? Do you trust the Mass, the Catholic Mass? And for atheists, atheists, they've come to the conclusion in their lives that they can trust that nothing exists after death. They're just biological, that nothing exists. Once you flatline, you're just need to be buried or whatever. Atheists trust nothing exists after death, so while they are here in time, they'll say, when they're confronted with it, well, I trust in science. Well, science can't deliver eternal life. Uh, they perceive its findings, uh, and they espouse its findings. Or they trust in human reasoning that after life, there's nothing but biological life. They can't answer this the questions of the soul and the immateriality of the soul, but they'll say, well, I don't trust in anything but science and human reasoning. But I will say, in conclusion, everybody trusts something or someone, but the Bible says personal faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the assurance of things that are hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And ours is in the object of faith, who's Jesus Christ. And so as we look at that as just a part of our faith, let's look at the wreath of righteousness. Paul said, verse 8, after he said, I have fought a good fight, finished my course, and have kept the faith. Actually, the word A, as you see there in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. Actually, in the Greek, that's not an A. It's the definite article right there before the word good. It's a poor translation. It's the good fight. And it's specific, it's specific to the Christian faith. Some people say, well, I, you know, I fought the good fight of cancer. I fought the good fight of the, of, the, of the man on Wall Street. I fought the good fight of this, that, and the other. I'm going to get a reward. I was a good soldier in the, in the Marines or the, or the Marine. I was a good Army person, a good Air Force person, a good Navy person. I fought the good fight, um, whatever. Kept the chin up for my kids. Now, this specifically relates to the faith. I've fought the good fight, have finished the course, have kept or guarded the faith. The word kept there means to guard the faith. Henceforth, that's a big part there. There's laid up for me this crown of righteousness. One of the basic themes of this study has been that what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God carries it out. Okay, you have the legislative side and you have uh, the uh, part of the judicial side, which is law enforcement. That's what this is. And, and so God and his person is all three branches of what we represent as our government. The executive side, the judicial side, and the um Legislative side, I guess that's the third part. One writes the rules, one enforces the rules, and one <laughs> oversees the policy. Basically what happens. Well, God does all three. <laughs> you know why? Uh, because he's the sovereign of the universe. And he's fair. So one of the basic themes in this study has been what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God definitely carries out in all fairness. This has been true in every imputation which we have studied. When God's justice is satisfied with our lives as we conform to his right, righteous standards, 
then God is obligated to the integrity of his own word to bless any way that he can. I'm going to say that again. God obligates himself to do what he promises. He can do no less. That's why it's so important to know God. God has obligated himself to never break a vow. He has obligated himself to never break his word, whether we like it or not. That's why it's so important to get on track with what God likes and what God wants because he's obligated to bless you because you're doing the right thing. Now, people will not bless you often. People will curse you. People will turn against you. But God's righteousness and his justice will also be satisfied in their life. He knows where they are. They're not, they can't hide from God. They'll never be able to hide from God. The Bible is, we, my wife and I heard a sermon the other night. God is greater than the light. God is greater than the darkness. Not, no one can hide from God. And for those who may be online or other places who think that they can hide from God, wake up. You're not going to hide from God. And you're not going to pull the wool over his eyes. And part of being mature is you say, that's right. One of the signs of maturity as a human being is that you acknowledge things that are right in front of your face. And as part of being a good Christian and maturing as a Christian, you acknowledge what's right before you. And so do I. We have to do that. But the God's blessings include eternal rewards given to the believer at the Bema seat the judgment seat of Christ. That's when I believe it's done. We have mentioned before that all blessings imputed as eternal blessings to us as believers are predicated upon those who qualify to receive those blessings. We played according to God's rules as 2 Timothy 2.5. We talked about last uh, Wednesday, this past Wednesday, that you don't get rewarded for shooting the ball out of bounds, though it may look like a spectacular shot or catching a pass that your toe tipped out of bounds. You don't get credit for it. Or you drop the ball, but it sure looks so good. But we play according to God's rules, not our own, if we're going to be rewarded. And the key is to learn his mandates or rules or guidances or guidelines. That's not just guidelines for our personal life. It also would include guidelines for our service. So the rules are the mandates laid down in the Word of God which are under instruction to follow. You know, God doesn't care if I have a hundred, a hundred thousand, or twenty sheep that I'm responsible for. My blessings that I get at the Bema seat, I'm going to tell you the way I pastor, I pastor in a selfish way. Because I am not going to let a church rob me of my blessings at the Bema seat forcing me or trying to get me to do something that I see that is contrary to the Word of God. Now, I can be definitely wrong. Don't get me wrong, and I've got the Word of God wrong. But if I've got the Word of God wrong, someone's going to have to prove it to me. Because I don't answer for you, and you don't answer for me, right? So that makes it that I'm selfish in the fact that I do minister and administer the church the way I do because I'm trying to use scripture, not fads, not knee-jerk reactions, as the way to guide and lead God's people. I can't lead negative people. I don't try to. I can only lead positive people. The sheep that don't want to follow, I can't lead. I'm not going to try to round up and scratch your way at. I don't have a responsibility. That's the chief shepherd's job. Mine is to take the ones that are in the pen and work with them, the ones that will go out into the places where I will lead and guide with the feed that I have to give. And I can't give some other minister's feed. I can only give the feed that is given to me by the ghost of God and the word of God. So we learn the rules, we learn the mandates laid down in the Word of God, which are under instruction to follow all of us, I am. They are not our own rules for what we think Christians ought to be doing or how the church ought to be operated. The rules say we are to be continually submitting to the Word of the Lord and as it changes our character as well. 
So we are to be decreasing from our earthly pursuits and ever increasing selflessly to live under God's will and his pursuits. This is the example the Lord gave us while he was here on earth. We are changing as we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and his character through the word of God or by means of the word of God. And the longer we stay in the word, the longer you stay in the word, the more you're going to find an estrangement from those who do not. Now you can write that down. Please don't overlook that important aspect. The longer and the more you learn and grow, not just in church, I encourage you also to learn at home. The more you do so, the more you're going to find yourself estranged from other believers. And if they mean more to you than the Word of God, then there's a problem. And I, you don't answer to me for it, but you will answer for it at the beam of seat of Christ. And I will answer for it at the beam of seat of Christ. I will answer for it myself. Yeah, I got friends too. Got two of them. <laughs> no. I got family too. You understand what I'm saying? Because I have seen family drag people out of this church. Good folks dragged out of this church because there was a spouse or there was someone who was dissatisfied. And they had to drag them out. Then they had to drag the whole family. And then they drug their friends out too. Why doesn't that go the other way to where somebody is positive with the Word of God and they stay positive with the Word of God and they drag their friends into the church? Drag their friends into the Word. That's the way it's supposed to be. We, all, we, all you and I can do is try. But when we have changes that God demands of our soul, things that He calls on our habits to change, our speech to change, our outlook to change, well, it's incumbent upon us to make those changes. Those changes rack up rewards. You are submitting to the changes that God wants in your life calls you to rack up rewards. That's what, as Paul said, that's fighting the good fight. That's fighting the good fight. Now, keeping the word and keeping the faith, that's guarding the faith. That's sticking true to the word of God. But there's also that good fight also that you haven't given in. These changes demand sacrifice, sometimes what we want for what he wants. The change from the self-life to the Christ-like life demands that we identify with Christ's sufferings. So in this crown of righteousness, this wreath as all the others, it cannot be tainted or gained at the bema seat of Christ by means of bribery or human good. You have to earn this one honestly. I have to earn this wreath as we would all others we have to earn the wreath honestly so it's not tainted, okay? And this is part of the gold, silver, and precious stone part of it. All right, this crown is also not based on any particular spiritual gift that you or I may have. I don't have any more qualification to get it than you do. All believers can qualify for this special award. Also, this wreath and all it represents for eternity is based on what you would see in, in short in verse 7. That they had a consistent anticipation of hope number 3, which followed their living the good fight. There are believers who are not anticipating, as verse 8 ends, loving his appearance, this award given to all of them also that love his appearing at the end of verse 8, this crown of righteousness that Paul knew that he would get, that other believers will also receive. Because believers who are not fighting the good faith are not looking for the Lord. Believers who are not finishing the course and keeping and guarding the faith, they're not looking for Jesus Christ. They're looking for the next best deal at the mall. They're looking for the next best deal satisfaction of the flesh or the intellect in some other capacity. They're looking for self-fulfillment. But what the Christian is to be looking for is Christ fulfillment. That is the great big chasm within Christianity that separates, as it were, Hades from paradise and the gulf that is fixed between the two. There is a great gulf fixed between the believer the believer who is positive and the believer who is negative 
and it is a great gulf that is fixed between the two. And provided you want to stay positive, you see from a perceptive perspective that you don't want to go negative because you know the storm that you're going into if you do go negative. And that helps become a preventer of going off the correct <coughs> road, going into sin and living in a hardened life. And the believer that is on the other side has become so callous that, I'm going to say this, if you have become so callous that you don't sense the Spirit of God moving you to confession of sin, there's a good chance you're never coming back. You may be saved, but you're going to get in by the skin of your teeth. The hair on your rear will be burning when you're at the beam of seat of Christ because you just got in by the skin of your teeth. I'm, I'm being a little bit rough right now, but the truth of the matter is the pansy mindset that is in Christianity today has the mindset that you're going to get over on God, that people are going to get over on Him, and that ain't going to happen. That, that is the deceit of the old sin nature, that we're going to get over on God. We're not. There is a great blessing to come and a great life to live now. The word hope. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only but to all them that do love his appearing. That is something that we have to look forward to. There are so many things that we look forward to. You can have the hope of salvation, the hope of maturity, and the hope of glorification in Christ. And that's where chapter 8, at the end of verse 8, refers to. All of them also that love is appearing. And that is that you look forward to glorification of being with the Lord in heaven. When you look forward to glorification of being the Lord in heaven, it means that you have been living for the Lord on the earth. This wreath is not for those who simply stare into the sky while fixating on some mental aberrations about God either. Oh, I just love him at his appearing. Okay, are you doing verse 7? Fighting the good fight? Staying with the word? Doing what God calls you to do each day? Are you guarding the faith? Are you doing those things? Am I doing those things? This wreath henceforth can be for those believers. This wreath or this crown is not a prize for one who tries to lather up emotional feelings toward God. This, this wreath has got a, absolutely nothing to do with emotions. It's got to do with being faithful. God never in the scripture calls us to be emotional, calls us to be faithful. That is the thing that sports athletes, when they win a prize or a golf tournament, oh, I saw your emotions there when you came out there. All the, the emotions, we serve the God of our emotions in America today. It's something terrible. And in most churches, that is something that they have to fight. Most just give in to it. But emotions, is like emotional experiences becomes the God. That's what's behind so much of the crazy music that churches and the world has. It's just emotion. Have you, have you seen all the weird dancing and everything? Just turn the music completely off and see how stupid those people look. I'm just saying, turn the music off and then watch. Is that something that makes sense? No, there's nothing wrong with dance and music if it's decent dance and music. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But some of this herky-jerky stuff is just the kind of stuff that shows that the mind is being overrun by something that doesn't flow. Doesn't flow. But the wreath, the crown is not a prize for who can be the most emotional, have the most feelings. It's, it's, it's awarded to any believer in Christ, yes, who follows verse 7, who henceforth fought the good fight, finished the course, that didn't give up because things got tough, and kept or guarded the faith. Tereo is the word there for kept, and it means a military guard who, who guards with their life a precious object. You keep the faith. It's not for those who gave up the fight against the world, this award does not go to those who gave up the fight against the world and who gave in. Uh, it's not for the believer who sold their birthright for a mess of porridge as Esau did. In other words, they didn't 
forfeit their eternal crowns to satisfy the lust of the old sin nature. They did not forfeit their eternal crowns to ingratiate themselves or to posture themselves to, some, to be some great person. This crown is not for those who quit the course, which by way is outlined, of course, in the Word of God. So we're closing. It's not for those who gave up on the faith or gave up on the word. Thus, we may qualify for these wonderful reads so long as we remain faithful to the word, even when the word of God sometimes steps on our toes, steps on mine sometimes. That's where I wear steel-toed shoes when I come to church. <laughs> we must confess our sins when we are wrong, and we must humbly move forward in faith. That's all any of us can do. That's all I can do. I can't pay God back for my as a form of penance because that doesn't work. Only through Christ is God satisfied. So enough of this penance type stuff. Just tell God I was wrong. I'm sorry. I confess it and go on. And that's it. Don't try to feel like you have to keep on. You're not really forgiven and you don't really mean it unless you get really emotional. Because you can just as emotionally react and turn away again. Never look at emotions as to satisfaction like it's a quota of emotions as to whether or not well, I meant when I used 1 John 1, 9 to confess my sins as a believer. Never let your emotions say, well, you know, I don't feel like I really meant that enough. Never do that because the Bible says nothing about if you don't really feel it, it didn't really matter. There are a lot of people who have remorse who never repent. They just keep on doing the same dumb thing. And growth in the Word, it takes growth in the Word to keep from doing the same dumb thing over and over and over. And eventually, it will prove that you'll get through it. You will get through it as God flushes it out. So we may qualify so long as we remain faithful when the Word calls us to worship. And that's part of faithfulness too, is being faithful when the Word calls us to worship. And... Uh, and all that's involved in obedience uh, as we as we grow. So the crown of righteousness, uh, it follows verse 7. It's kind of the quick answer for that and as to what that fully stands for. So we'll pick up some more, on, Lord willing, on Wednesday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your goodness to us and your blessings. Thank you for your kindness. We ask now that you would continue to instruct us and lift us up in strength your strength. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.